Welcome to Installing and Configuring Windows Server 2019. In this course, we're going to go over Windows Server 2019, how to install it, and configuring some of the basic necessities like getting it connected to the network. First, let's talk about what Windows Server 2019 is and what's new about it. So if you're not familiar, Windows Server 2019 is the newest version of the Microsoft Server Operating System. Windows Server operating systems are different from your typical desktop versions like Windows 10 in that they're built to run enterprise level applications. These servers can even run with a very minimal graphical interface, so they can be managed remotely. They can typically take advantage of higher grade hardware and address more memory than what you'd get out of a standard desktop computer. Windows Server 2019, like previous versions, has three different purchasing options. First, there's the Data Center Edition, and this is the most expensive and is licensed per core of the hardware you're installing it on. If you're not aware, typically each server has a physical processor, at least one, and then each of those processors has multiple cores. So if you have a server with two physical processors, and each one is a quad core, then you'd have a total of eight cores, so two physical processors times four cores in each processor. Data Center gives many additional features and licenses that you don't get with the other versions. Standard Edition is the most common, and that's what you're going to find running in pretty much most medium to large enterprise businesses. This is also licensed per core of the hardware you're installing it on, and gives you all of the typical features that you need. Lastly, there's Essentials, and this is mainly for small businesses with a small footprint, and it's about half the price of the Standard Edition. So what is new in Windows Server 2019? To start, System Insights, which brings local predictive analytics capabilities to Windows Server. This is all part of the AI machine learning thing that you're probably hearing about. Um, it's kind of the bud buzzword for this year and a little bit at the end of the last year. Next is Windows Defender Advanced Threat Protection. Now, Windows Defender has been around for a while, but with Server 2019, it has more added to it, like reducing the attack service, protecting point networks, endpoint networks, protecting folders from ransomware, and even more protection. Linux containers running on a Windows host. You can now run Windows and Linux-based containers on the same container host. In previous versions, you could only run Windows containers within a Windows host. Encrypted networks allows encryption of virtual traffic between virtual machines. This is actually a really huge uh, feature that's been added, and it allows us now to actually create entirely isolated environments where even the transmission and the traffic between those two, between those servers in this isolated environment is encrypted. Huge, huge advantage that I'm definitely going to be spending a lot of time playing with. Network performance improvements for virtual workloads. It now maximizes the network throughput to virtual machines without requiring you to constantly tweak your host to get the best performance out of it. And a whole lot more that we're not going to have time to go into here. So in the next lecture, we're going to go and dive right in and obtain the ISO for Windows Server 2019, and then we're going to get straight into the install. So the first thing we need to do is we need to obtain the ISO or the evaluation ISO image from Microsoft so we can build our Windows 2019 server. You can simply search for Windows Server 2019 evaluation, but I'm happy to provide you the link that I'm going to use here to get you your evaluation ISO. So if we head over to this evaluation page, we're asked for how we want to evaluate Windows Server 2019. And you also can notice that this is a 180-day license or evaluation period. So basically half a year, six months roughly. We're going to select ISO because that's what we want and that is going to be the most versatile here. We can actually use an ISO to install Windows Server 2019 in Hyper-V, in VMware, in uh, VirtualBox, and we can even write that ISO to a DVD or a USB drive and install it on a physical server. The other two options, Azure and VHD, are both specific to Microsoft. So Azure is going to be Microsoft's cloud offering, where a VHD can work with Azure, but it's also specific to Hyper-V. But with all that being said now, we're going to just go ahead and select ISO. So we'll click Continue here, and we're going to go ahead and fill out all of our information. And I'll just go ahead and put in my information here. 
Yeah. Let's see. We got seat. I am going to be a business executive because that makes the most sense for me. And country United States. And forgive me that I am blanking out my work email address and my work phone number. All right, and we'll just go ahead and click continue here. And now we get to select our language. Obviously for us, we're gonna be English. And then we just simply click download. Now, depending upon your network speed, you can see down here at the bottom that it is starting to download the file. Now again, depending on your network speed, this could take anywhere from 10 minutes to even a couple hours, depending on your network speed. I have a very fast connection, and you can see right now it's sitting at about five minutes is what it's gonna take. But through the magic of video, I can make my network connection pretty much instantaneous, and we don't have to wait for this to download to happen. Once you have the ISO, you can now mount it directly to a virtual machine, or you can turn it into a bootable USB drive to install Server 2019 on a physical server. We're going to mount the ISO to our virtual machine and then perform the install from there. Now, I'm not going to go into the details here of how you mount a USB to either a Hyper-V or a VMware, but what I will tell you is that we have mounted the ISO onto a VMware server, and we're now going to start the server up and boot and do an install through the ISO. So you can see I have my server here, Learn Server 2019 is what I've actually named it, and we're going to go ahead and power this guy on, and what we should see shortly is a option for loading files. So now sometimes it'll tell you up here at the top that you need to press a button, other times it's just going to boot. If it's a brand new server and there's nothing on the hard drive, it's going to just straight boot right into the CD or the ISO. So you can see now that it's spinning, and we're going to get right into the install here. Once we're into the beginning of the install, we're going to select our language. So here it's going to be English, and we're just click Next, and then we're going to click Install Now. Notice down here at the bottom that there is a repair mode option, or repair your computer. Now, if we had already, say, installed Windows Server 2019, and we needed to, and it got hosed, and we needed to get into the operating system and run some commands on it, that's what we would use this for repair your computer, but we're not. It's We're doing a fresh install, so we'll just do install now. It's going to start the setup, and then it's going to ask us for a product key. Don't worry here, you don't need one. <laughs> Some people see this kind of freak out, and then they don't know what to do. Microsoft doesn't make it incredibly easy. Notice down here at the bottom, there is a link that says, I don't have a product key. Simply click that guy, and it's going to take you right on into the install. Now, notice we have two different types here. We have the Windows Server Standard Edition and Windows Server Data Center. Notice that Essentials is not here. And the reason Essentials is not here is because that is a completely different ISO altogether. Windows Server Standard and Windows Server Data Center Editions all come on the same ISO. There's really not a whole lot of difference in the coding behind them. It's pretty much just the licensing and what you're paying for in the back end. Now the default installation is Windows Server 2019 standard without the desktop experience. This is formerly known as Server Core. Now Server Core is a great thing to use if you don't need that graphical interface and you'll be managing the server completely remote. If you're not aware, Server Core is pretty much a graphical-less interface. If you've ever used Linux, it's pretty much what you get when you build a Linux server. You're just at a command prompt when you log into it. When you log into a Server Core installation, you're at a command prompt. You have access to the command prompt as well as PowerShell and a couple of the other small utilities, but it's very, very stripped down. The reason for this is to, one, reduce the size of the install, and two, to reduce the need for patching. Most of the Windows patches are fixing problems with the graphical interface or applications that run on the graphical interface. So by completely removing that graphical interface, you don't have as many patches every month to apply to Windows Server Core servers. For the purposes of this course, however, we're going to choose Windows Server 2019 Standard with the desktop experience. That way we can actually log into it and see it as you typically know a server. So we'll choose Standard here and we'll go ahead and click Next. 
And as we have to do with all Microsoft software, we have got to go ahead and accept their license terms. So we check the box and click next. And now we're actually going to get into the crux of the installation. So it seems unlikely, but we're going to choose a custom install. One of the default options here is upgrade. And that is typically if you already have a Windows Server, say 2012, R2, or 2016, and you want to upgrade that to Server 2019. We're doing a fresh install from scratch because we also want a little more control over it. We're going to choose custom install. Now, we only have one drive here in the server, and you can select it and click next. However, if you want more control, you can take that drive and you can actually create a new partition with it. And you can create all the different partitions that you want and then choose a particular partition that you want to install Windows Server 2019 on. For us, because this is a VM, it's a small hard drive, and there's only really one, we're just going to click it and choose Next, and Windows is going to do all the partitioning for us. So now Windows is going to go through and it's going to do the entire install of the Windows Server operating system. And I know you don't want to sit here and watch this counter slowly count away. So once again, through the miracle of video editing, I'm going to speed this up drastically for you so we can get it over with and we can move on to the next section. And there we have it. Windows Server 2019 is now installed for us, and it's going to go through its initial setup, which could cause the server to reboot a few more times, as you noticed, until we're finally prompted here to create the administrator password. So I'm going to go ahead and just create me a super secret password that I'm not going to tell you. And we'll click Finish. And it's going to finalize all our settings and log us into or bring us to the login screen of the server and we can simply issue in this case a control alt delete put in our super secret password and we're brought right to the desktop of our newly built server now in the next lecture we're going to go through and we're going to configure networking on our server so in the last lecture we went over downloading the windows server 2019 iso and then installing it in my VMware environment. Now I realize that you may not have a VMware environment, you may not even know what VMware is. So in this lecture, I'm gonna go over how you can download a piece of software called VirtualBox, which is totally free, and you can download it on your own home computer and use that to install Windows Server 2019 in your own virtual environment. So let's get started. So let's first open up a browser any browser is just fine, and we're going to go to virtualbox.org. Now, VirtualBox is a piece of software that is called a hypervisor software, and this allows you to actually run virtual machines on your own computer. Now, I'm not going to get too deep into that because that's a topic for a different lecture, but we're going to download it, and you'll understand how it works. So we're just going to click this big download 6.0 button, and I'm running a Windows computer, so we're going to download it for Windows hosts. And you can see down here at the bottom, it's already running. So we're going to go ahead and just let that finish, and then we're going to go into the installation. Now that's finished in Chrome here, I can just click this button, and it's going to go ahead and run the installation for me. Now, what we can see here is the typical when you install a software, welcome to in this case, Oracle VM VirtualBox. We're just going to go ahead and click Next. It's going to give us the ability to actually determine what we want to install. We want to install everything, so we'll go ahead and click Next. It's going to give me a couple more options. I typically turn these off, just personal preference. Next. Now it's going to give a warning because it needs to actually add on to your network adapter. This again, not a huge deal. You just may drop network connectivity momentarily when this install happens. So we're okay with that. We'll click yes. And now that we've done everything, we'll click install. It's gonna run through, it's gonna install. And pretty easy. Now that we're done, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna launch it by leaving that checkbox checked. And there we have it. So now we have VirtualBox installed. I'm going to minimize this. And we're going to create our new VM. It's going to be very simple. So basically from this configuration, we're just going to do new. Very simple. It's going to give us the information we need to create the virtual machine. So we're going to call this Windows Server 2019. Pretty special. 
then we're going to choose the operating system here. Now, it's very possible, depending upon the version of VirtualBox that you have installed, it may not include the most current Windows operating system. Not a big deal if your operating system's not there. You can really just choose Windows Server 2016 is perfectly fine, or you can choose other Windows. I'm just going to choose 2016 because it's the closest. Then we'll do next. Now we're going to tell it how much memory we want to give, and this is really the RAM memory or the random access memory. So what we want to make sure that we do is we need to make sure we save enough for our oper for our operating system as well. And what you can see here is right now it's set at 2048 or 2048 megabytes, which is 2 gigs. And you can see the maximum I can set it at is 16 gigs, which is the 16,000 megabytes. And you can see the nice little graph here that kind of goes from green to orange to red. And this is warning us that we're starting to use up more memory than we should within our operating system. So what's going to happen here is when I determine how much memory I want to give this guy, it's going to take that memory from my currently running operating system. So I'm running Windows 10 on my computer. It's going to take that memory from the computer and give it to this virtual machine. So I have 16 gigs. We really can do this with two, giving it to the virtual machine if you want. I'm going to give it four just so it runs nice and smooth. So we'll go ahead and click Next. And now it wants us to create a virtual hard disk. So again, I don't want to go too deep into virtualization, but we need to create a hard disk for this virtual machine. And it's really just going to be a simple file. So we'll leave that selected and click Next. And we're going to set VDI because this is the VirtualBox default image. And we'll click Next. We want it to dynamically allocate. That means basically the drive will grow as we need it to grow. And then we'll click Next. And now we select what size we want it to be. 50 gigs in this case is more than enough. So we'll click Create. And there you have it. Our VM is now created. So there's a couple of things we're going to have to do. But for the most part, we've completely created the VM. So now if I want to go in and edit any of the pieces, I can click Settings and we can go through and edit whatever we need to. So the first thing I want to go through and edit is storage. And what you can see here is we have our hard drive here, and then we have this, it looks like a CD because that's exactly what it is. It's a DVD drive or CD drive. So what I want to do here is, now I want to mount that ISO that we downloaded in the previous lecture. So from here, we're going to choose the virtual optical disk and I have one on here called ISOs, and that's where we're going to go. So we're going to do ISOs, and I'm going to choose the Windows 2019 one that we downloaded. Now you see I have a lot here, but this is the one I want, the EN Windows Server 2019 that we downloaded in the previous lecture. So we're going to go ahead and select that guy, and you can see now he's associated. So that's perfect. I want to look at networking. There's not much we have to do here. By default, we can give our virtual machine four adapters. We're only going to give it one, and we're going to choose NAT because that's going to work just fine for our purposes. So perfect. So we'll click OK here. And now when we're ready, we can go ahead and click Start on our virtual machine. It will launch a new window, which is our virtual machine, and you'll see we'll actually start to go through the installation of Windows Server. So that's how you install VirtualBox on your computer and set up your first Windows Server 2019 virtual machine. Networking on a server is very important. This is how our server connects to the internet, other servers, and clients. Without network connection, our server can't do most of the things you would want a server to do. This is why we need to go ahead and configure networking. But before we do, let's take a look at our server and change its name from the default one because the default one's a little annoying. So let me go ahead and we're gonna log in to our server with our super secret password that we created in the last lecture. And we're going to do this through Server Manager, which very conveniently pops up as soon as you log in. And we're going to go ahead and click Local Server, and we can see all of our options right here on different things we can configure for this local server. So the first thing we notice in the top left hand corner we have computer name and it's win with a kind of random string of characters. We can change this 
by simply clicking on the name. As you can see, it's kind of like a hyperlink. Once we click it, we're taken to the system's property page where we can see the information. Now, if we click on this change button, we're taken to where we can actually change the name of our server. So let's go ahead and we're going to change this to Learn Server 2019. We'll just kind of leave it the name that I named the actual virtual machine. And once we do that, we'll click OK. And it's going to tell us that before we can actually apply these changes, the computer's going to need to restart. So we're going to continue to have our old name until we actually reboot the computer. And we'll say OK to that. And then we'll go ahead and click Close. And it's going to prompt us one more time to go ahead and restart. We're going to go ahead and restart now. And luckily, through the beauty, again, of video editing, I'm going to speed everything up. And we'll be right back where we started to do our networking. Most home networks deploy what's called DHCP so that a computer or server will get an address automatically. Typically in businesses, this is not the case because we want our servers to be addressed statically and not get a dynamic address. And that way we can access them every time through the same address. If you're not aware, DHCP is a service that most routers have, most home routers have, that can actually automatically assign IP addresses to computers that way you don't have to worry about statically assigning them. It's great for client machines, but doesn't work incredibly well for servers. So in our example here, the network we're going to use starts with 192.168.10, and then the last piece of that IP address is the address that we're going to give our server, the specific number. For our server, we will be using 192.168.10.100. So to set this, it's very simple, and there's multiple ways that you can do this. Um, there's multiple ways you can get to the settings page to do it, and you can even do it through command line. One way is to actually go down here to the lower right-hand corner where you can see your network and that it's unidentified. And if we right-click on that guy, we can do Open Network and Internet Settings. Then we can click Change Adapter Options. And then from here, we'll see all of the available network adapters that the server has. Now, since this is a virtual machine, I told it how many adapters that I wanted it to have. So we're only seeing one here. Now, if we were building a physical server, it's very possible we could see two or even more. Most physical server hardware comes with two network adapters, and some may even come with four. However, only one JJO is connected, assuming that you connected the server to a switch. Any network adapters that don't have a connection will show a red X on the adapter. To change the settings, we're going to simply right click on the network adapter we want to configure and we're going to choose properties. So from here, we have two different types of IP addresses we can assign. The first is IPv4 Internet Protocol version 4, which is the typical IP addresses that we all know and love. The second is Internet Protocol version 6, or IPv6, which is the newer standard of IP addressing that the world is kind of switching to. IPv6 resembles more of a MAC address and gives us a very large number of possibilities for an IP address. However, we will be setting the IPv4 address because that's still the normal setup and my lab is not configured for IPv6 just yet. Now we click the Internet Protocol version 4 service here making sure that we do not uncheck it because that will disable IPv4. Once it's selected, we choose Properties, and then we get a smaller window basically asking us for the information. So right now, it's selected to obtain an IP address automatically, which means it's set up to get a DHCP address, as we mentioned earlier. Well, we don't want this to happen, so we're going to choose Use the following IP address. And in this case, we're going to type in the one that we decided, 192.168.10.100. Now we're going to put in our subnet mask. And for our subnet mask, we're going to do the default, which is 255.255.255.0. The subnet mask is very important to understand when you get a little bit more into networking. And I'm certainly going to go over much of this in future courses and some other courses that I'll have up. But for now, just know that we need our network subnet mask to be 255.255.255.0. So next we need to put in that default gateway we talked about, which is basically the router address that we have set up. And the one that I have set up is 192.168.10.1. So for example, let's say we have server A, server B, and server C. 
Server A and server B are on the same network. So they will talk directly to each other with, without a problem or needing a default gateway. Now we also have server C here, which is on a different network. In order for server A or server B to talk to server C, they must go through a router. To get to server C, and this router is the server's default gateway. So the router IP address is what we're going to set our server as the default gateway. Now, obviously I'm way oversimplifying how this routing works and how the default gateway works in networking, but I just wanted to give you a very quick high-level example for those who are not familiar with networking or default gateway. So for us, that default gateway is going to be 192.168.10.1. The last thing we need to configure is the DNS server. Now, DNS, if you're not aware, stands for Domain Name System. And it's basically a way of taking easily remembered names like Google.com or thesysadminschool.com and changing those into not so easily remembered IP addresses. So we're going to select use the following DNS server addresses, which was selected automatically for us when we turned off DHCP. And we have the option of setting a primary and a backup, basically so we set the primary and if for whatever reason we can't access that, it's going to fail over to the second one, which gives us redundancy. And in a business environment, this is going to typically be your internal DNS servers. But for our example here, we're going to use Google's public DNS servers. So those are 8.8.8.8 .8 and 8.8.4.4. Now that we have all that set up, we should be able to access the internet. So we're going to go ahead and just click OK, and then we're going to click Close. And we can see that we're connected because it's asking if I want to connect to other networks or other PCs in my network. I'm going to go ahead and say No. And we're going to confirm that we're connected to the internet by bringing up a command prompt. And I'm just going to use PowerShell here. And we're going to simply ping. And basically a ping is like sonar. <laughs> we're going to send a ping out. And if it hits something, it's going to send a response back to ping 8.8.8.8. .8 and you can see we're getting a reply from 8.8.8.8. .8 the other way we can confirm now that DNS is working is we're going to ping google.com. And what you'll see is Google.com gets resolved to an actual IP address. That is what we then ping. So because that we actually resolved it to an IP address, we know that our DNS is configured appropriately. So there you have it. We've successfully configured networking on our Windows Server 2019 server. In the next lecture, we're going to be configuring RDP for remote desktop and looking at sconfig. In this lecture, we're going to enable remote desktop and then we will confirm that appropriate firewall ports are open for it. Then we'll take a look at sconfig and what configuration options we have from there. We can enable remote desktop from server manager here. We simply just go to the local server and we can see that remote desktop is listed in here and it's currently selected as disabled. So all we have to do is click on the little disabled link here and it's going to bring us into system properties right to remote desktop. So all we have to do now is select allow remote connections to this computer. It's going to tell us that firewall exceptions are going to be enabled, but we're going to confirm that in a minute. So we'll click OK. And we want to make sure we leave this checkbox on. Allow connections only from computers running remote desktop with network level authentication. This is important because it's much more secure this way. Now if you have a lot of legacy computers, even some older Linux computers that do remote desktop into Windows servers, you may have to uncheck this, but ideally you want to leave this checked. We can also go in here and select specific users we want to grant access to be able to remote into this server. I'm going to leave this at default just because we don't have any users configured on this server. So we'll click cancel there, and I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And it's now enabled. Even though it's showing disabled here on the desktop, we can click it and confirm again. It is actually enabled. The desktop screen just not, has not refreshed yet. So now that we've enabled this, let's make sure that the firewall ports are allowed. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up firewall. So Windows Defender Firewall with Advanced Security. 
and we're click on here on the left on inbound rules because these are the rules that either allow or disallow traffic into our server. So if we click this guy and then we start scrolling down here, since they're all in alphabetical order, we will see remote desktop. And there's a couple additional ones here, but what we want are the three that are part of the remote desktop group. And you can see they're already enabled. If they weren't, we could simply click them, right click and choose enable. In this case, it's saying disable because they're already enabled. So perfect, we've now configured remote desktop on our server. So let's now take a look at sconfig. We can just close this window and we can, we'll go ahead and just minimize this one. And sconfig is a very powerful and useful tool that I really love for initial setup and configuration of a server. This tool is useful to learn, it's super easy to learn, because it can be used not only for Windows with a GUI, but also server core when you have a very limited interface. To get into sconfig, all we have to do is open up a command prompt or PowerShell as an administrator. So I'm just going to open up PowerShell here as an administrator. And then we just simply type sconfig. And you can see we're brought into server configuration. And there's a lot of options we have here. We can change the computer name. We can add it to a domain or a work group. We can configure remote management. We can even do our configuration of remote desktop from here. We can do our network configuration from here, and we can also initiate Windows updates from here, which is a great thing to do. You can remote into a server, initiate Windows updates, and just let it roll. So sconfig is a really powerful tool to use and to learn and get familiar with because you can use it again across Windows Server with a GUI or Windows Server Core. In the next lecture, we're going to go over roles and features within Windows Server 2019. In this lecture, we're going to go over roles and features on Windows Server 2019. Roles and features are a very important part of any Windows Server, and that includes Windows Server 2019. Roles and features are really what makes a server a server. So let's start by going over the difference between a role and a feature. A, a role is typically something that you install, and it's the main purpose of a server. IS, for example, is a role because when you build an IS server, it really should be only an IIS, IIS server. If you're not aware, IIS is Microsoft's web server software. So it's basically what hosts websites running on Microsoft servers. Where feature is sometimes a specific aspect of a role or a totally separate application altogether. So going back to the IIS example, default documents is a feature of the IIS role, but it is still a feature. Features can also be tools that get installed with roles. Another example is when you install the Hyper-V role, it will automatically install the Hyper-V management tools, which show as a feature. This is an example of where you can install the Hyper-V management tools without installing the Hyper-V role. So I hope you kind of see where that's going. It's not too confusing. You can install the Hyper-V management tools by themselves without installing the role, but they get installed automatically if you install the role. So let's go ahead and install the IIS role on our Windows Server 2019. And first, we're going to start by using Server Manager, which again, very conveniently pops up when we log in. And we're going to do this first by clicking on Manager, Manage, and then Add Roles and Features. And it's going to give us this little pop-up saying, before you begin, it's going to tell me a little bit about this wizard and how to use it. I typically click the skip this page by default because I don't need to continually see this. So we'll go ahead and click next. And we're going to choose role-based or feature-based installation because that's what we're doing. And then click next. This window is a great one to look at. And when Microsoft implemented this version, really, of Server Manager in Windows 2012 R2, it became possible to start installing roles and features on servers that are not the one you're currently on. You can even install this server manager program on your local Windows 10 machine and install roles and features remotely. This really kind of escalated the being able to remotely control stuff and remotely do stuff. You could actually push out roles to say 10 servers all at once from one management interface and it really saves a whole lot of time. Our server is the only one in our list here, so we're just going to choose that, and we're going to go ahead and click Next. Now, this window gives us a list of all the roles that we can install on in our server. So we're going to just scroll on down here, and we're going to choose Web Server IIS. 
and you'll see we're immediately prompted for the features, some of the features that are required to install along with this role. And we can see that it's actually the IIS management console. So we're going to go ahead and say, yes, we want to install this role. We'll add this feature. Then we can go ahead and click next. And we're going to see all the features that we can install. Now, these are not role specific features or role specific services, but they are other features we could install. We're not going to add any of them at this time. So we'll go ahead and click next. And now we're going to get into the actual web server part. So now we're seeing this window talking about web server role, which is IIS. And then if we click next, we see all the role services or other features that are installed with the IIS role. And we can turn these on or turn them off and you can kind of see what's already selected and what options we have. We're going to leave everything at default right now. And we're going to go ahead and just click next. Now, at the last window is our confirmation. It's going to tell us everything that's going to get installed. And if we're happy with that, we can go ahead and just click install and let it go. Now, one of the great things is you can go ahead and close this window at any time. It's not a big deal. It's going to continue to go on in the background. And the great thing, once again, about my video editing that I love is we don't have to wait for this to complete through the beauty of it. We'll just speed up this video and we're going to be done in IS web servers now installed. One of the great things about Windows Server is we can automate this entire process using PowerShell. So let's install a feature using PowerShell. The first thing, let's go ahead and open PowerShell. And if you're not familiar, PowerShell is basically a command prompt that Windows developed to kind of combat with Bash. Uh, Linux Bash is incredibly powerful and PowerShell is as well. Microsoft, everything they write at this point can typically be done via PowerShell and that allows you to pretty much automate everything. It allows you to automate anything you really want and creating these types of installs is one of them. So the first thing now that we've launched PowerShell we're going to do an import module and that module is going to be server manager. And this is basically importing the PowerShell commands that we're going to need to install our feature. And then we can do a get windows and we tab complete feature. And it's going to give us a list of every possible feature, which is great. We can literally, if we don't know exactly what we want to install, we can scroll through this list and find what we want to install. We are going to install the Telnet client right here pretty easily done. And to do that, we're going to use the command add windows feature telnet client. That simple. Now you can see the bar at the top that starts to progress as it actually does the install that we need. Very similar to the bar we saw when we were installing the IIS service. So this is going to just run on through pretty quickly since it's just a telnet client. That's all it is, and once it's done, we'll be able to actually test and confirm that Telnet is installed. And to test that Telnet installed, we'll just simply run Telnet. Pretty simple. And you can see we're now in the Microsoft Telnet client. And we're just going to go ahead and type quit to leave Telnet client. And we're back to our PowerShell command prompt. Pretty simple. In the next lecture, we're going to sum up the course and talk about some next steps that you can take. All right, so let's sum up this course and what we've talked about. First, congratulations on finishing this mini course. We went over many things here. We talked about the different versions of Server 2019 and what new features we get with Server 2019. We went through the install of Windows Server 2019. We installed the IIS role as well as the Telnet client feature, and we configured networking on the Windows 2019 server. So where do you go next? Well, this course is really just the beginning and it just scratches the surface of Windows Server 2019 and server administration. If you want to learn more, please subscribe to my site and check out some of my other courses at courses.thesysadminschool.com. I hope you enjoyed this course and please let me know if you have any questions at all. Feel free to contact me at support at thesysadminschool.com.
And if you have any ideas for any future courses or mini courses that you'd like me to create, please feel free to contact me at courseideas at thesisadminschool.com. Thanks, and I look forward to seeing you again.